Well, we have been talking about uh, nutrition, vitamins, stem cell, mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, you heard a wonderful lecture on calcium. So, and I'm again bringing back your attention to where I started yesterday. <clears throat> that why are we all here? I mean, there are so many diseases or so many disorders, pathogenic conditions that we have been talking about, but what we need to focus on is what is causing all of those issues, right? The mechanisms. And I'm always bringing back everybody's attention to that basic mechanism which is causing. So anyways, you promised that you're my friends now, right? And so let's start with a game because when we are friends, we can, we can play games together, right? And I think it's time that maybe we need uh, to stretch a little bit. So, and don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to dance today. But if you can please stand up wherever you are. Again, nothing crazy today. It's a very simple game, and you will understand why we, we are playing this game. So I'm going to show you some of the statements here on the screen. And if your answer to that statement or a question is a no, then you can sit down, okay? Is that a deal? Is that a good, a simple game? Yeah. Simple rules? So the winner will be the one standing, still standing at the end. So let's see how many of you will be the winners of this game today. All right? So you're not a smoker. So if you smoke, please sit down. Nobody? All right, excellent. I'm impressed. Your BMI is less than 25. And if your BMI is more than 25, please sit down. And don't look at your neighbors. <clears throat> All right. Well, the next one is you exercise at least 30 minutes per day for five days a week. And if you don't do that, please sit down. <clears throat> Guys, well, I'm, I'm actually still impressed. There are still some people standing, right? This is awesome. So you eat at least five servings of fresh fruits and vegetables every day. And if your answer is a no, Please sit down. <clears throat> You're all doctors. You don't consume alcohol or only tw once or twice every week. If your answer is a no, please sit down. Wonderful. I, we still have two more people. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's not over yet. We still have one more question. And let's see who's the winner. We have one... Two, three, three in the room. Let's see who's going to be the winner now. You have no stress. <laughs> I have never found a winner. I have never found a winner. And you know what I'm trying to say here, right? You know where I'm going with this game. And this is sad part. We really, really need to find that winner someday. Someday soon. We really need to change our lifestyle. So simple to say, but very, very difficult to do it. It's very simple to say it to our patients. But before we say anything to our patients, we have to find a winner in this room at least, <laughs> right? And this is the reason the numbers of all of these chronic diseases are going up. The statistics is really bad. One death every 34 seconds. And, and this is just in the US uh, because of cardiovascular disease. So during my lecture, at least 60 people are going to die just because of the cardiovascular disease. And most of them are younger people. This is really very sad. Diabetes, again, this is not a new piece of information. You all know the statistics, right? Obesity, 
cardiovascular disease, diabetes. What is the reason? Well, we played that game. You all know what is the reason. It's the changes in our lifestyle. I think our ancestors were much better off. They had a much better lifestyle. They were more active. They were eating organic food. Well, now we have started going back to what our ancestors were telling us to do. We didn't listen to them. We thought we are going to make our life easier, much faster, more convenient. And, but what did we do? What did we end up with? Or was it the sugar consumption, which is something that has added on to all of these issues? If you look at these numbers, starting from 1700, data from 1700 to 2000, as the sugar consumption increased, the, the uh, diabetes increased, and all the chronic uh, issues uh, became more and more. Or is it the changes in our eating patterns, the choices that we make? Well, yesterday I was walking around in the, um, in the exhibit area, and I saw there were apples sitting there, and nobody was picking apples. And when I came inside, all that beautiful dessert was gone. <laughs> Everybody was enjoying that, including myself. And nobody picked up the apples. And, well, this is the new concept of fitness, because we want convenience everywhere. We want convenience and exercise as well. Convenience and our lifestyle is so messed up. We are going to different extremes now, right? And this is, I mean, this looks funny, but this is really serious. We are creating problems for our next generation and the generations to follow. This is what we are trying, we are exposing them to, the different kind of lifestyle, which they don't really deserve. And of course, the stress, all kinds of stress. So this is where I wanted to bring your attention to. So when, whenever we are talking about stress, we are talking about adrenals. Now, you saw that stress is basically causing pretty much every issue that we see today. And because of the involvement of adrenals, in our lifestyle. And because we are stressing our adrenals so much, we are abusing our body by abusing our adrenals. Now, I don't need to go into anatomy of the adrenals, but just so you know, uh, there is this capsule adrenal cortex where, which basically produces your cortisol pregnenolone, progesterone, estrogen. So we will be talking about these hormones today uh, because, as I said yesterday, I'm very, very passionate about keeping a good hormone balance because nothing in body works in isolation. And these hormones play such a significant role in controlling most of the physiology in our bodies, right? And since we are talking about adrenals, distress, adrenal fatigue, or adrenal dysfunction, we'll focus on cortisol. Cortisol is known as the principal stress hormone, fight or flight response, right? Let me ask you, how many of you uh, test cortisol in your practices? How many of you care about cortisol in your patients? for any issues for that matter. Thank you, I, I mean, I see so many hands up here. Thank you. So what does it do? Basically, it increases heart rate, increases blood pressure, blood sugar, boosts immune, immune function, boosts and suppresses. And suppresses when it's chronic, boosts when it's acute. So I, I will talk more details on that. And breaks down muscle. So there are some positive effects of cortisol. Since it's there, it has a positive role in the body. There are negative effects of cortisol. There are positive effects of cortisol. As long as we are able to maintain a normal physiology of these hormones, including cortisol here, we can be in good shape. So what are the positive effects? Quick burst of energy for survival reasons. We need to react 
to any stress situations. So we need energy. Heightened memory functions, a burst of increased immunity. So that's a positive effect. So here it's boosting, immune booster. Lower sensitivity to pain. Like when you're reacting to stress and injury, you, for some time you forget that pain. And that's because of your increased, suddenly increased levels of cortisol. That's, that's helping you fight against that pain. Helps maintain overall homeostasis in your body. What are the negative effects of this hormone? Impaired cognitive performance. So whenever you are reacting to a stress situation, you can't make rational decisions because you're not thinking right. And that's because of increased cortisol levels. That it, it impairs your cognitive performance abilities. Suppresses your thyroid function because whenever you're under stress, your thyroid is not working properly because of the cortisol. High cortisol levels decrease thyroid activity. Blood sugar imbalances. So normally cortisol boosts sugar levels, increases metabolism, but when it's chronic, then the effects are reversed. And that's what I'm talking about when I say negative effects of cortisol. Decreased bone density, decrease in muscle tissue, higher blood pressure, lowered immunity and inflammatory response, and increased abdominal fat. So it has a significant role in metabolic syndrome. As the cortisol levels stay up for a longer period of time, that leads to increased abdominal fat, the belly fat, the visceral fat. And so your goal should be to bring down the cortisol levels and not let it stay up chronically for long period of time. So what does it do? Let's look at this little cartoon here. It shows the HP axis and the stress response system. What's happening here is when your hypothalamus is activated under stress, it tells the pituitary to release ACTH, which activates the adrenals right, fires up the adrenals to produce cortisol and DHEA. In acute stress situation, there is a negative feedback when there is enough cortisol in your body to respond to that stress situation. The negative feedback cycle, the, the, the negative feedback loop tells the brain, tells the hypothalamus to stop doing that job and because the body says I don't need more cortisol so stop producing more cortisol. That's normal in under normal situation. And whatever cortisol is made it goes into the cell, binds with the cortisol receptor and goes through the gene transcription and causes all of the functions that it's supposed to do. Increase gluconeogenesis, decreased insulin sensitivity, thyroid function is compromised, so on and so forth. So all of these listed here. This is what a basic overview of the HPA axis and release of cortisol along with DHEA. So effects of chronically high cortisol, Cushing syndrome, that's very, very common. How many of you uh, have seen patients with Cushing's? Do you see? Patients with Cushing's? Great, thank you. So normally you see weight gain, accumulation of abdominal fat in those patients, in rounded face, and that's very um, common in those patients. Okay, so this slide, I'm going to wait downstairs there, and I'll give you 30 seconds. I will have a test after 30 seconds. <laughs> no, I, don't worry. I mean, I know you cannot read anything on this slide right now, and I don't expect you to. So I will help you to understand what I'm trying to show here. 
So whenever there is chronic stress and there is overproduction of cortisol, that process or that situation, that stage is called pregnenolone steel. Have you, has anybody heard about pregnenolone steel? Anybody in the audience? You know what, I feel so great. <laughs> there is so much of new information that I'm able to give to all of you. So it's, isn't it worth every penny, right? <laughs> all right, so let me help you understand this. So here's this cortisol on, uh, not cortisol, cholesterol on top. So cholesterol is not that bad. We, we really need this uh, cholesterol because it makes all the hormones. So cholesterol converts to uh, pregnenolone, progesterone, DHEA, androstenedione, testosterone, and estrogens, and all the estrogen metabolites, right? And in under normal situation, under normal conditions, when everything is good and fine, these hormones bind with their specific receptors inside the, the cell, and they do their job, and everything is great under normal situation. But when there is chronic stress, when there is chronic stress, what happens is that everything stops. None of this is functioning normally. No hormones are being produced normally, and there is only overproduction of cortisol. And there's continuous production of cortisol, and this is what is called pregnenolone steel, because all of the cholesterol in your body is basically used up producing cortisol and not producing any other hormones, so which is not a good thing. Let me make it very simple. Well, this graph that you see on your screen shows what happens when there's chronically elevated cortisol level, which eventually leads to adrenal fatigue. Have you heard about adrenal fatigue? This is what happens in adrenal fatigue or adrenal dysfunction. So what happens is, as you can see in, uh, after this normal stage, stage one, stage two, stage three, and then complete failure, in stage one, your cortisol is going up Right? The cortisol starts to increase in stage one. You see that peak. Pregnenolone starts to decline. It's kind of a plateau here in stage one, but in stage two, it's going down. DHEA starts to go down because of the elevated cortisol, because of the stress. And then eventually, all of these fall to almost zero. And that's when we call that stage as adrenal failure. So adrenal fatigue has been categorized by Dr. James Wilson in these four stages, leading to overall adrenal failure. Now, yesterday I was talking about cortisol testing and saliva being the best option to test for cortisol. How many of you use saliva testing? in this audience, anybody, nobody? Really, one, two, yeah, a few. Anybody who is using cortisol testing should be testing in saliva, why? Well, saliva has been established as a gold standard for measuring cortisol levels. The reason is that when you're testing blood, when you're asking your patients to get their blood drawn, just a needle prick raises cortisol levels. It's stress, right? Most of us are so scared of those needles. I mean, we don't care if we send our patients to the lab. Go get your blood drawn. But when we have to go to the lab to get the blood drawn, our cortisol is al already high, even before looking at that needle, the syringe. Can you expect a normal baseline cortisol when the, you have already created a stress? 
Number two reason, well, saliva, there's no stress. We are just spitting in the tube and uh, there's no stress. Number two reason, which is the most, which actually is the most important reason, is that in saliva, you're measuring a free bioavailable fraction of the hormone. In blood, you're measuring total hormone, which is free plus bound hormone. The hormone is bound with binding globulins in blood. So you're measuring the total amount of hormone, which actually doesn't help much, which doesn't correlate well with clinical symptoms. Why? Because you want to know what is the level of free fraction of hormone which is available for the tissues, which goes into the tissues to do its job. So you need to understand the difference when to choose blood or when to use saliva or when to use urine for testing different analytes that you're testing on a daily basis. Anyways, so I just wanted to show you what is the pattern, what is the normal diurnal pattern of cortisol that you see when you test in saliva. When you wake up in the morning, your cortisol is at its peak. And as the day goes by, your cortisol drops. And at night, your cortisol should be almost zero so that, so that can sleep, right? So that you can, your, you, you can get melatonin production because melatonin production starts only when cortisol is low. But what happens in most of these diseases, most of the cases in your patients, what you will see if you tested those patients, these are some of the patterns that you will see. In the morning it's high, then it's low, then it again goes up. Same thing, it, in the morning the cortisol is high, it comes low in the afternoon or evening, then at night it goes up. Most of the patients, depression patients, depression cases, the night cortisol is always high. And that's the reason they can't sleep. Breast cancer patients, their night cortisol is high. Did you know that? The last one, the most, uh, like the cortisol is almost gone. There is no cortisol. This is a typical case of adrenal failure, adrenal fatigue, where you see no cortisol throughout the day. Well, since we are talking about mitochondria in this conference, what happens to the mitochondria when there is acute stress or chronic stress? Under acute stress, your mitochondria are fired up to produce a lot of ATP molecules, right? Very few reactive oxygen species. But when there is chronic stress, the process actually reverses. There's not much energy there. There's not many ATPs formed. There's a lot of reactive oxygen species formed. I mean, you, you saw all the details about mitochondrial dysfunction. So mitochondrial dysfunction begins under chronic stress conditions when cortisol levels are high or stay high. This is what we call as adrenal fatigue. I know you all will look like this at the end of the day today. What are the signs and symptoms of adrenal fatigue? Well, I think it's very obvious what are the signs and symptoms of adrenal fatigue. You have no energy, you don't want to do anything, you have no interest in anything, your craving for salt is high, any kind of stimulants or bad food is, looks good to you, you're constantly tired, you're completely irritated, you don't want to talk to anybody, uh, you just want to sit on your couch with a TV remote in your hand and you don't like any channels on your TV. Uh, that's very common, right? Muscular weakness, estrogen dominance symptoms start to appear. Now, what does that mean, estrogen dominance? 
Estrogen dominance means your estrogen levels are relatively higher to your progesterone levels, especially in women. So this is what I want your attention to when I'm talking about estrogen dominance and adrenal fatigue and whenever I say that it's so, so important to maintain a good hormone balance in your body. You remember yesterday I was saying that all of these hormones, they work together in conjunction with each other. Sex hormones, thyroid hormones, insulin, they all work together. It's like a symphony. Remember I mentioned it's like a symphony, orchestra. Any instrument in orchestra stops playing right or is out of tune, the whole symphony is disturbed. You don't like that music. Same thing with hormones. Normal physiological conditions, you have to have the right amount of hormone in your body. The ratios are very, very important. Whenever you're testing for these hormone levels, it does not matter if these hormone levels are within the normal range. Well, that's another thing because I have a very big problem with the broad ranges for everything that we have today. We have to tighten most of the ranges. Anyways, I, I will get emotional talking about that and that will take my two hours gone on that topic. So let me come back to what I'm trying to say here when I say hormone balance and estrogen dominance. Even though your estrogen and progesterone might be in the normal range, so-called normal range, still you might be a case of estrogen dominance. Why? Because your estrogen levels might be higher relative to your progesterone levels. Even though both of them are in the normal range, still you might be the case of estrogen dominance. And most of the postmenopausal women or perimenopausal women are estrogen dominant. And why I'm saying that is I have tested almost 2 million people in my lab. I have data from 2 million people. You might have tested maybe 100 or 500 or 1,000 people, but I have data from 2 million people. And I see that data. I see what is most common problem that most of the perimenopausal and postmenopausal women are facing today. And why most of their loved ones or husbands or boyfriends or even their doctor, they don't understand what they're going through. They always say it's in your mind. But those women know what they're going through. Anyways, let me come back to adrenals. <clears throat> There's no sex drive. There are allergy symptoms, all kinds of allergy symptoms. And that's very, very common in case of adrenal fatigue or adrenal failure. Hypothyroidism, and you start to have a lot of edema everywhere, very, very common. What are the energy patterns? Well, as I said, you don't really want to wake up in the morning. You, you just want to stay in bed for a longer period of time. But then you get a, a burst of energy by mid-afternoon. I mean, you're able to kind of drag yourself out of bed and you're able to get some energy in your body by mid-afternoon. And what happens is then it suddenly drops, the, your energy level drops, right after you've been able to drag yourself out of bed and somehow you went to work. But by the time you, went, you arrived at work, your energy levels are again down. You get a second burst of energy around 6 p.m. or so in the evening. You can do whatever you want to do at that time. But again, you feel tired. There is a third burst of energy around 11 p.m. if you're still awake. Well, you will be awake because your cortisol levels are high. And then you want to sleep more in the morning. You want to sleep in. Again, the same pattern. 
So basically, this is not the energy pattern that you're looking for, right? You want the energy pattern. You want maximum energy when you wake up in the morning. You want good high levels of cortisol in the morning so that it can take you throughout the day to do all your job. All right? Are you still with me? Yes. Thank you very much. So your cortisol levels are good enough, right? See, I know, I know, I have not forgotten that there is only one thing in between you and lunch today, standing, and that's me. But you know what? They told me that lunch is not ready, so keep going as long as you want, right? Because they didn't tell me the secret, but I found out that all the chickens that they brought for lunch, they all ran away. <laughs> so that's why they are trying to arrange something. Um, anyways, <clears throat> so I think you got the idea what I'm trying to say. Uh, what happens in adrenal fatigue? So craving for salty food is high. Uh, intolerance to potassium and all kinds of bad food looks good to you. Uh, when, when your cortisol levels are not really what they should be. Your blood pressure drops when, when you're basically in the lying position and when you wake up, your blood pressure drops. That's very, very common. And in these patients, pupil contraction, it, it does not hold the contraction when you put light in their eyes. It cannot hold the contraction. And surgeon's white line. I'm sure you all know what surgeon's white line, right? When you draw a line on abdomen with any blunt object, it should be red, right? But it stays white. So positive Rogoff sign, so pain or tenderness over adrenals when pressed. So these are kind of things to help you clinically. What happens to the skin? Uh, it tends to be dry and thin. Perspiration is not normal uh, in those patients. And hypothyroidism, very, very common. Thyroid is not working at its, at its normal. Again, back to the lab hormones assessment, what you need to be testing for. Well, right now you just saw what are the clinical uh, symptoms and conditions that you should be looking for. What are the tests? Cortisol and DHEA, very, very important uh, tests. Again, I always recommend testing these hormones in saliva for the same reason that I said that you measure free fraction of hormones. And actually, if you want to talk more about uh, the lab testing, the lab part of the hormones, we have an expert here, Dr. Sonia. Dr. Sonia, you want to stand up and show them, wave to everybody? So if you have any questions about lab testing, please talk to her. Bug her as much as you can, because she bugs me all the time. <laughs> um, no. Measure testosterone levels, because cortisol and testosterone work together. When I said that increased cortisol levels result in increased fat levels, visceral fat in, in the belly, that's through testosterone because testosterone levels go down. The cortisol goes up, testosterone goes down, and most of the diabetic men with big belly, their hormone levels are, show this pattern. High cortisol, low testosterone. And testosterone supplementation has been shown to be very, very helpful in these men, especially men, because you see most of men with metabolic syndrome, right? All those pregnant men, very, very common in Asia. Well, now in the US also, there are a lot of pregnant men. You know what I'm talking about, right? Big belly. So their testosterone is low, their cortisol is high, their est estradiol is high. So this is a very, very common pattern that you see in, uh, in these men. And uh, so estrogen, well, I just said estrogen, but progesterone is also very, very important 
because you have to know the ratios. The progesteron to estrogen ratio is the most important. Cortisol to DHEA ratio is most important. Even if all of these hormones will be in the normal range, you have to look at their ratios because ratios change clinically with different conditions. So that's very important. Test for insulin resistance and glucose dysregulation because I said that sex hormones, thyroid hormones, and insulin, they all work in conjunction with each other. Nothing works in isolation. Everything, whatever is there in the body, it has a job to do, right? And that's why it's there. So we can't ignore anything. When I'm saying hormones, but everything is important. So we have to put it all together to make a sense out of it. And so sometimes I get, I start talking philosophically because um, the other night also I was talking to somebody and I said that we feel that we know so much of science, we know so much of clinical knowledge and data, but I think whatever we know is still a drop in the ocean. Would you agree with me on that? It's still a drop in the ocean. We still have to learn a lot. We still have to put together those pieces of the puzzle and find out, okay, what's going on? What is the answer? And for that, it's really, really important that we all work together and leave aside our strong egos. Let's embrace each and every concept out there great piece of knowledge in these conferences. Every speaker brings wonderful piece of information and we have to put it all together. Well, I brought some of the test reports to show you some of the patterns. Well, this is a kind of a normal test report, common test report that we produce from our lab. Different hormone levels, and we show, shows different ranges but what I want to uh, show you here is the cortisol patterns. Under normal conditions, this is what you see. See, the red shows the high range, and the blue line shows the low range of cortisol. And the black one is for the patient. So it shows a normal cortisol, cortisol pattern. Make sure whenever you are testing for cortisol, always, always, always four-point cortisol. Never do only morning cortisol. And this is because even if your morning cortisol is normal, your afternoon or your bedtime cortisol might not be normal. So you'll miss the boat if you didn't test all the four cortisol throughout the day. Another one, as you can see here, the morning cortisol is higher than normal range much, much higher because this person woke up too stressed in the morning. The morning cortisol is so high. It goes down, then again it goes up, again bedtime it's down to almost zero. Another one, a typical case of breast cancer patient where you see night cortisol is always high. Same pattern you see in depression patients. Bipolar disorder, same pattern. Their night cortisol is always high. And this is one reason they cannot get a good sleep. The goal in those patients, whoever cannot get a good sleep, you have to bring their cortisol levels down to help them. Another one where cortisol is high throughout, it's higher than the normal range throughout the day. These people are always too active, full of energy, hypersensitive or hyperactive. So their cortisol always stays up. 
higher than the normal range. So you'll see different, different types of patterns in different kinds of patients. Another one, typical case of adrenal fatigue, where the cortisol level is dropped to almost negligible. It's as close to the normal, like the lower range, uh, part of the range. So what do you do for these patients when we are talking adrenal fatigue? How do you help them? What are the lifestyle changes for these patients? Minimize stress in life again and again. See, it's very simple to say reduce stress. But it takes a lot of effort and energy, a lot of collaboration between you and your patients to help them minimize stress in life. Recognize, anticipate, and balance all stressful events. Find personal ways. You just can't tell somebody that do this so that your stress will be reduced. Everybody has their own individual way of reducing stress. So find out, talk to them, and help them reduce that stress. Lie down during work breaks, brief 15, 30 minutes at 10 a.m., and then again between 3 to 5 p.m. So this, this is the time when you can, okay. Well, they said another two hours. As she was showing me that board, she said another two hours. No, she said 15 minutes. <laughs> exercise is helpful, but not competitive exercise mild exercise, which everybody loves to do as much as it's not competitive. Try to go to bed by 9, 9.30, like me. 9.30, my switch is off. No matter how much you keep, try to keep me awake, everybody at home, they are so frustrated with me because, <laughs> because even if while we are watching a movie at home, 9.30, I'm gone. But I love that because at 6 a.m., I'm up. My switch is on. I don't need any alarm. And that's something I really, really love about myself. And this is something that I want everybody to be able to do. Get a good night's sleep. Be stress-free. Build that habit. And they say that if you do something consistently or constantly for 14 days, it becomes a habit. Try it. Really, I'm not, I'm not lying. Everybody's just looking at me with different looks. <laughs> and it's easy, trust me. So sleep in until, <laughs> well, it's difficult to sleep in until 9 a.m. Uh, I know everybody uh, here might say that it's impossible to sleep in until 9 a.m. every day because everybody has to go to work or do something important. But you can laugh. It doesn't cost anything, right? It's not difficult. It's easy. Laughter is the most helpful in the case of adrenal fatigue patients. There are laughter clubs. I, I heard that in Asia there are laughter clubs. I know there are laughter clubs in India. Are there any in Philippines? Are there any laughter clubs in Philippines? I think we need one. We need one, right? Oh, you don't need one? Oh, excellent. Oh, see, this is wonderful. I love that. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. So actively diffuse tension and stress, eliminate or minimize any negative energy, even people and events. Negative energy means negative people around you. I know most of the family is always, I mean, there is at least one or two. Uh, you can't avoid them, but uh, try to avoid negative energy from people around you. Daily break for enjoyment, regular meals, regular relaxation, breathing exercises. See, again, in these lectures yesterday and today, I'm not giving you any, well, I did give some new information, but 
I'm not giving a lot of new information. This is all known for many, many years. It's just that we all need those reminders. And we all need to give those reminders to those patients. Did, did you smile today? Yes, you did. Nutrition. What do you need uh, in, in your diet? Emphasize good quality proteins, combine unrefined carbohydrates, whole grains. Again, eat right and exercise. I am saying that again and again. Dr. Lambert said that yesterday. Eat right and exercise. Use cold pressed oils, uh, olive oil, walnut. Uh, avoid all kinds of hydrogenated fats and caffeine. Unrefined salt to be added to whatever food you want to eat. Eat by 10 a.m. and again before noon. Eat regular meals, mini meals. Remember mini meals from yesterday's lecture? But not those other mini, mini meals. Avoid all kinds of hydrogenated fats, caffeine-containing foods, beverages, chocolate, white carbs. And I know you're all waiting for this. Please try to avoid all that good-looking stuff. Well, you can eat today, that's fine. <laughs> we can start from tomorrow. <laughs> that's what we say to ourselves every time, right? We'll start tomorrow. And that tomorrow never comes. So there are glandular extracts available to help in these types of patients. Multi-glandular extracts designed specifically for adrenals. There are several out there which contain adrenal, hypothalamus, pituitary, thyroid, and gonadal extracts combined together in these, um, um, in, in these uh, products. Use in conjunction with other treatments. Don't just completely de depend on these um, supplements, just the supplements. Vitamin C always on top. I mean, I couldn't say enough. Uh, so many people and so many wonderful speakers, experts have talked about vitamin C. There's enough said about vitamin C. All kinds of vitamins. You heard wonderful lecture from Dr. Sol on uh, uh, the nutrition, all kinds of vitamins. Zinc, selenium, copper, sodium, manganese. Then adrenal glandular extracts. Theanine is, has been shown to be very helpful in, in these uh, patients. Uh, vitamin C, well, I wrote here 2,000 to 5,000, but I learned in this conference that you can go as high as whatever you can tolerate, right? And that you have to find out what you can tolerate. Vitamin E, uh, Dr. Sol yesterday mentioned that uh, not the synthetic, but the natural vitamin E is helpful. So try to get that. Pantothenic acid, calcium, you heard calcium. Well, I said here 800 milligram that I pulled from Dr. James Wilson's book. Um, but after uh, listening to the lecture right before mine, um, I, I think we can make that uh, determination there. Magnesium, organic trace minerals. So in addition to that, complete stress management is extremely, extremely important. Reduce stress, simple ways, meditation. Transcendental meditation has been shown to be extremely, extremely helpful in treating patients with adrenal fatigue and even adrenal failure. Just transcendental meditation. Very, very simple and easy to practice transcendental meditation, right? Even just closing your eyes for 30 seconds helps you kind of rejuvenate, bring back your mind-body medicine, um, mind-body balance, and bring your hormones under control, bring your cortisol to almost uh, normal levels. Exercise, as I said, not competitive exercise, uh, just normal 150 minutes per week. If you can do that, great. 90 minutes vigorous aerobic activity to improve any kind of glycemic control or weight management. So anybody working on weight management, exercise is a little bit more on that. Advise patients to start slowly and gradually build intensity. 
because every time we make a resolution that from tomorrow onwards, I'm going to work out 60 minutes. Never happens. So start slowly and then build that intensity. Talk to your, talking to your patients is the most important part. You can heal your patients at least half of the treatment is already done when you're talking to them. Just hold their hand and talk to them. Listen to them because you will understand them much better. And then monitor. Don't expect them to monitor. You have to monitor. Well, you ask them to collaborate, but you have to participate and monitor. You have to show them that you really, really care. Put them in the driver's seat of their health and wellness, but not like this one, right? Do we have more time, just four or five minutes? Can I talk about this? Okay. This is something that I was storing until the end. Um, many people have now been very, very fascinated and, and have seen wonderful results using adaptogens, along with all the other stuff that we talked about, the diet and the exercise and stress reduction. In addition to that, some of these adaptogens are showing excellent results. There are studies, there is scientific data, and well, I'm not going to read all the dosing here because you'll, you'll have access to these slides uh, later on. So ashwagandha, Siberian ginseng, licorice root, maca root, rhodiola, bacopa, holy basil, all of these are, are excellent. Um, I, I won't call them s supplements, but adaptogens. Uh, these are helpful in basically, they're great antioxidants. First of all, they're great antioxidants. They increase the detoxifying enzymes significantly. When I say detoxifying enzymes, you all know what are the cytochrome P450, phase one and phase two enzymes, right? Phase one enzymes increase or activate anything foreign to the body, and phase two enzymes detoxify anything foreign or anything bad to the body, right? So detoxifying enzymes, when I'm saying detoxifying enzymes, I'm talking about superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, catalase, and so on and so forth. So all of these detoxifying enzymes, the levels increase using these adaptogens. In addition to great, being the great antioxidants, reduce lipid peroxidation reduce oxidative damage. I mean, these are great things that these adaptogens can do. So try to, and, and they have no side effects, right? So try to use these in addition to all the good stuff that we talked about. And um, I think I will stop right here and not go into detail. See, I'm so disappointed that I can't go here because you guys closed this island. I'm really, really disappointed. So Dr. Homer has to invite me next year again, right? <laughs>